they asked if it was okay for them to use my medical records so that way they could have more patients with heart defects to be able to deliver a baby. And they wanted to record it into their document on the whole process that I had because I was the first wow. single ventricle patient at that Scott and White to ever have a baby. How safe is it for a woman born with hypoplastic right heart syndrome to get pregnant and carry a baby to term? What considerations need to be made when heart warriors with complex CHDs decide to get pregnant? What advice does a heart warrior mom have for others concerning having a baby? Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am Anna Jaworski, heart mom to a 28-year-old single ventricle survivor, I'm an author and the host of your program. Today's Saturday success story features Caitlin Scoggins, who I have been waiting to have on my program for a very long time. So let me tell you a little bit about Katie and then we'll start our conversation. Katie was born with a critical congenital heart defect known as hypoplastic right heart syndrome. Unlike many people born with HRHS, she has not had the Fontier procedure and she's done very well medically. Katie was homeschooled and she and I have known each other, I don't know, Katie, forever. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been I a while. Re- it's been a long while. So I even had her attend Toastmasters meetings with me when she was an intern working for Heart Should I the Globe a long time ago. So she is pure Texan. And I can't wait for us to get started with this. But I do need to let you know, she was also working with the Texas chapter at the Children's Heart Foundation. And she got married to the love of her life, Christopher Scoggins, in May 2018. And they welcomed their son, Isaiah, into the world in December 2019. So today she's coming on the show to talk to me about parenthood as an HRHS survivor. So welcome to the show, Katie. Thank you. I'm so excited to finally be here and to be able to do this with you. I am too. And I'm especially excited about this topic. So when did you realize, Katie, that you wanted to be a mom? I think it was early on. I have a brother who's seven years younger than me. So watching my mom be a mom to him and him being a newborn, it's just always put that in me that I want to be a mom. Do you think you were like a little mom to your brother? Uh, In ways, yes. And then in other ways, I still had the only child mentality. I still was like, (laughs) I I would pray with him when I wanted to. And then I was like, no, let me have time to myself type deal. So I had a little bit of both worlds. (laughs) (laughs) I know, but you were so sweet. Whenever I got together with you and your family, you were always so sweet to your brother. He's lucky. He had a big sister who was sweet to him, not one who picked on him or tormented him. Or at least that's what I saw. I don't know. Was there some picking on and tormenting going on in the background? (laughs) Yeah, there was a little. We had our stages. I was definitely a teenager when he got into the pickiness, and I'm just like over it. We've had our moments. Well, as you know, being born with a critical congenital heart defect, there were times, especially given when you were born. Do you mind sharing what year you were born? I was born in 1995. So in the 1990s, it was not uncommon for the doctors to warn against kids with critical congenital heart defects having babies. What was it like for you? Did your doctor tell your mom or talk to you about maybe you shouldn't have a baby? Yes. I love cardiologists growing up because they're almost like a second set of parents. They always go through the talks with you. So it was always, it was a never like straight out, no, you can't have kids. It was always, it's going to be very dangerous and there's going to have to be a lot of things in place in order for that to happen. And we'll talk about it when you're in the situation wanting to have a baby. Okay. So then you got married to Christopher. How long was it after you were married that you all decided you wanted to start a family? So I will say we were not expecting Isaiah. We knew we won from God. (laughs) It was a gift. I definitely stressed a lot of doctors out. Found out I was pregnant with him six months after I had a pacemaker implant. Oh, wow. So they had (laughs) Katie. Yes. 
Yes. We knew we always wanted kids, but we were waiting like, okay, when we're ready to have kids, maybe a couple of years after marriage, we'll go to the cardiologist and have a plan and have everything set in motion before I got pregnant. But we had to skip a couple of steps because I ended up in the ER sick and found out at the oh. ER visit that I was pregnant. And oh, I had my everybody. Goodness, you didn't even have any idea, Katie? No. I had bronchitis that week and then I started throwing up blood and I'm like, that's not normal. Went to the ER and they're like, you're fine. You just have bronchitis and you're having morning sickness because you're pregnant. That's how I found out. Oh my word. Wow. Okay. So this was truly a gift from God. And you were surprised. Yes. So please tell me that you contacted your cardiologist shortly after you found out. Oh, yes, I did. I called the cardiologist. Thankfully, it was at the ER, so they got all the appointments set up. I went in two days after that. You did it right away. Yes, because they were like, with your heart condition, because it was over here at Scott and White, it was like, with your heart condition, we need to get you set up with your cardiologist so that way you could start a plan with him. And then two days after that appointment, I went to labor and delivery and did the normal testing that each woman would do when she finds out she's pregnant, make sure the levels are good, that there is an embryo, all of that stuff, and then went from there to find what I needed to do. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so were you considered a high-risk pregnancy? Oh, yes. I had an OBGYN, and then I also saw the whole entire floor of maternal fetal doctors. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I saw all of them plus cardiologist and then I had a pacemaker. So electrophysiologist. The one thing is they really wanted me to go be seen at Texas Children's Hospital. But I lived about four hours away and financially that just wasn't going to work out. And I didn't want my husband to miss out on everything. So I had a very long, in-depth conversation with my cardiologist, with the team. How can I have a baby at Scott & White? Home Tonight Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Okay, so before the break, Katie, you are wondering, how can we make this work out? I'm at Baylor Scott & White in Temple, Texas, but they want me to go all the way to Houston, which is quite a distance. How did they make it work out for you? Thankfully, my cardiologist, he was a pediatric cardiologist, but he has been a pediatric cardiologist for many years. So a lot of his patients have been adults. And he also works with Texas Children's Hospital and was able to confide in them and see what are things that they can do at Scott and White to deliver a healthy baby. And they all went in a boardroom together with my electrophysiologist, with OBGYN, the maternal fetal specialist. Okay. And so you had quite a big team that was helping you. That's amazing. Yes. Yes. And these were all Uh, Scott and White. Yes. 
Yes, they were. The first trimester, besides the morning sickness, was really easy. They're more concerned whenever you're in the middle of your second trimester into your third trimester with your heart and how the heart's going to function with having a baby. Because the more you're growing a baby inside of you, the more your heart's pumping, the more blood flow. One thing that they had to do with my pacemaker is they had to bump my pacemaker up to go no lower than 80. So that way my oh. heart have a lot more pumping. So I had a lot more blood flowing. So me and the baby could have enough blood to the body. Um, wow. Okay. So that's good that you had that pacemaker and they were able to have that amount of control over you. Exactly. And you had not had a pacemaker when you were younger. No, I got it six months after I got married. So that was oh. fun. Oh. <laughs> My poor wow. husband was so scared. He's like, I thought you were fine. And then we got married. And so, yes, it but was. But see, that was a times. blessing. But that was, was a blessing it because was. by having that, you were seeing the electrophysiologist and they were able to keep tabs on you and at least feel reasonably sure that your heart was doing okay while you were carrying the baby. Aside from the electrophysiology concerns, what other risks did they tell you about and were they concerned with managing? The one big one was my pulmonary valve has a slow leak in it still. And I have been told since I was four years old that I will eventually need to have my pulmonary valve replaced. But each appointment, mm. it's still good. So the main concern was with all that blood flow going through, it might make the hole bigger. And they had me prepared. You might need an open heart surgery to replace your pulmonary valve after pregnancy because it could get bad. But thankfully, it stayed the same. Nothing changed with it. It still has wow. that small leak and it's still working properly and it's working fine for me. So the doctors are like, until that moment where it working fine for you no more, we're going to keep it at what it's doing. Yeah. Why fix it if it's functioning okay for you right now? But right. I'm glad to hear that they were aware that there was that possibility just so they could really keep a close eye on it. Did that mean right. that you had some echoes that you may not have had for them to just oh, continue yeah. to monitor it? Yes. I started going to the cardiologist, I think every two months just to get an echo done, just to get a checkup done. And then definitely Isaiah, my son, had a lot of ultrasounds and a lot of special tests just to make sure that he's doing good. So mm -hmm. thankfully, what they have told me is that usually they're more concerned heart-wise if it's the dad that was born with a congenital heart disease or had some heart issues, that usually really? the mother's... I mean, they're concerned still, but they're not as concerned because it's more prone with the dad. You're but the first have... person to tell me that, Katie. That's the first time I've heard that. Yeah. Because the man had... doesn't have to carry the baby. So you wouldn't right. think that it would be more of a concern. They were Trans saying with the genes and the genetics, with the baby having a heart condition, it would have mainly come from the dad side than the mom's side. Wow. Okay, that's the first time I've heard of that. That's amazing. You know what? They're always discovering new they information. Are. That's the thing is that we live in a day and age where research is abundant. And now there are so many more of you kids born with congenital heart defects who are surviving to adulthood that they're able to do more long-term studies or at least retrospective studies where they can get this kind of information. So that's right. that's very interesting to know. So that was a lot of doctor's appointments. Talk to me about yes. how your husband and your family were able to support you while you were going through that, because that sounds like that was a lot to go through. Yes, it was. And prior to that, I was having some issues because I needed the pacemaker. I was working full time as a custodian. So once I got pregnant, my doctor was like, no working. We need you uh, to be, you know, kind of set. So I did FMLA for pretty much all of my pregnancy. 
So literally my job was taking care of myself, getting to doctor's appointments. And I had all my family and then my husband's family lives here. So I'd have my mom or my mother-in-law or my dad go to appointments with me and do things in that way. One thing that I had a lot of issues with is I just could not keep anything down. I had really bad morning sickness. And that's usually common with a lot of pregnancies. So it's not just a heart thing. But right. because they wanted to make sure I was staying healthy and the baby was staying healthy, they actually had me a little chair in the infusion room at Scott and White. So whenever I just was not being able to keep anything down, I would go and get IV fluids and I'd get infusions to just make sure that my body was keeping up with nutrients. So that wow. way there wasn't fainting episode. So having my family there to take me there and sit with me because it's hours of just sitting there getting IV fluids. So just having them around to keep you company, keep you grounded and focused because there's always that fear in your head. And I was so nervous when I was pregnant. Every little thing I'm like, is that normal as a first time mom? Now, if I have another kid, I'd be like, oh yeah, that's totally normal. But being a new mom, yeah, but I hate to tell you this, love. Every pregnancy is different. <laughs> At least it was for me. It was a very different pregnancy. So that's why I really thought I was having a girl the second time because it was really different than the first pregnancy. But no, that's not how it worked out for me. So very interesting. Well, that's amazing that they were able to give you all of those infusions. I had so much vomiting when I was pregnant with Alex. Poor little Joey. Joey was three. And it was often Joey's job to run and get the bucket for mommy because I got sick so much. So it's nice to know that you could get those infusions. Wow, I wonder what that would have been yes. like if I would have been able to get infusions. That must have made you feel better because there were times I was vomiting a lot and it leaves you feeling weak. It's exhausting. It when, it was, when it first started happening, I kept going to the ER because I would get so weak where I couldn't even keep water down. And so finally, the OBGYN was like, oh, we are going to make this simpler. All you have to do is just call up the infusion room, tell them that you need one. They'll schedule you in and you just come up. So instead of having to go through the ER and do that protocol and be there for five right. hours, you come in for yeah. two hours and get your infusion. And they're like, we've never done this before, but we think we might start using this as something for pregnancy for those that have really bad warning sickness. So you might have helped them develop a new protocol, Katie. I remember a few days before I gave birth, I went in and talked to the team how labor is going to go. They asked if it was okay for them to use my medical records so they can actually put it into their documents. So that way they can have more patients with heart defects to be able to deliver a baby. And they wanted to record it into their documents on the whole process that I had because I was the first wow. single ventricle patient at that Scott and White to ever have a baby. So they were like, we oh want to keep gosh. this documented. And then also if I'm sticking with that team and I could have another child, they have that all set out. So it's okay. We got this plan. Let's go. Oh my gosh. That's so amazing. So you're a pioneer, Katie. Who would I have know. thought? Right? <laughs> okay. So you got lots of support from Baylor, Scott, and White. And you had lots of family support. Talk to me about the actual birth process. Because I know when I was a first-time mom, I was convinced there was no way I was going to be able to get a baby out naturally. And it did happen, but I think I amazed myself and everyone else that I was able to do it. I was convinced I was going to need a C-section. What did they tell you? So I actually got admitted into the ICU, not because anything was wrong, but they wanted to make sure that I was right above the surgical room just in case and also have the trained intensive care nurses to jump in if something cardiac had happened. So I right. did not stay in labor and delivery at all. I was in ICU okay. and they said, after you have your son and after everything is normal and we know you're okay, you will go to the heart unit. 
and you'll go to the heart floor so that way they can monitor your heart. The sure. only bad news about that is I was away from my son. That was the hardest. Thankfully, I had family there, so didn't miss a beat. I was induced. They wanted me induced at 37 weeks because they've said after 37 weeks, the baby is pretty much already developed. Everything's good. But if you go longer, we're scared that it's going to be too hard on your heart to be able mm. to deliver. So we would rather okay. do at 37 weeks, have you induced so that way we have control of the birth. Mm. And C-section was always just last resort, like with any other pregnancy. So the plan was to have a vaginal and they wanted to use forceps so that way I wasn't pushing a lot and my body wasn't stressing out as much. So they didn't want me okay. to push at all. Wow. But my stubborn child decided <laughs> he wanted to stay up high and he didn't want to really drop. So I was oh, in labor for yeah. close to 24 hours. Oh my gosh, it's so exhausting. It was. I had an epidural. I was induced. I wasn't in any pain or anything, but it was just having to switch positions constantly. And my body was uncomfortable because my sure. body is in the process of we're ready to have this baby. But this baby right. is just, nope, I don't want to come out. And so finally, oh the doctor, my OBGYN team came in and I was like, just let me push. I feel like if I push on the contraction, he's going to go where I need him to go. They're like, we don't want you to push. So finally, they're like, okay, go ahead and push. I pushed once. There he goes. They're like, oh, we're ready to deliver a baby now. I was oh like, you had to push. push. me. I could have pushed hours ago. We could have <laughs> this one on the road. And the what funny thing was, I was in the ICU, so you can only have one or two people come in the room at a time. It's about like eight o'clock now. All our family decided, okay, we don't think there's a baby coming for a while. We're going to go eat somewhere. And the only person that stayed was my mother-in-law. And she was in the room when they were like, baby time. She was like, it's just me. Oh, this is exciting. Oh my God. So she is waiting in the waiting room because just the ICU said I just wanted me and my husband because like you said, I had a huge team, right? When everything was getting ready, you had labor and delivery, which I had a labor and delivery nurse with me 24-7 while I was there. Wow. Wow. Constantly checking the baby, the contractions. They didn't leave my side. And then I had the ICU nurses to come in and out. And then obviously the different doctors. So they were all there setting up everything and getting ready. And we had so many people in that little small ICU room waiting on a baby. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect or CHD community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, the Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Heart to Heart with Anna is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.congenitalheartdefects.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. Okay, so you had this amazing team of people there with you. Did that lessen the fear that you think you might have had? Because I would be nervous. I was nervous. I didn't even have a heart defect. And I was really nervous when I was giving birth. Like I said, I was convinced I was going to need a C-section, but I didn't. But once I got into the labor and delivery room, which you never went to because you were in the ICU the whole time, okay. 
I felt like, okay, this is happening. It's like you said, I knew I needed to push. I didn't push very long. I had a fast labor compared to you. Mine was only eight hours for the first one. And I don't know. After a certain point, you're just like, get this baby out of me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> At least yes. I was. It was time. It was time. I knew I needed to get him out. So do you think that having all of those support staff there with you, that helped you to be able to just focus on what you needed to do and not worry about your own health very much? Yes, it definitely was. And they took a lot of the stress off of me. And really just whatever we can do to make this less stressful. Because as a heart patient, the more stress you're under, the higher your heart rate goes, the higher your blood pressure goes. So their whole job was how can we have the easiest birth we can? Mm -hmm. So they definitely mm -hmm. took a lot of stress off of me. That's so good. So it sounds like you had a really good birthing experience and the baby came out just fine. Yes, he was born with microtia, so he was born without a right ear, but heart-wise, oh. all normal, everything was normal. So the only thing we had to do with him is go to audiology and do those tests. But he came out 100% healthy, lungs were fully developed, heart was fully good, and it was just amazing that someone with half a heart can do this and can actually bring life into this world, only having half of your heart working your whole life. That is amazing to me. So tell me what life has been like since you had Isaiah, because you didn't have a whole lot of time to just be you and Christopher before you knew you were going to have Isaiah. How has having a baby changed your life? I would always laugh when women are like, when you have a child, it changes everything and it changes who you are. But it's so true. I can't imagine life without him anymore. And it's just yeah. been awesome. My husband and my son have such a connection and their love is just like in awe to see. And it's definitely strengthened us in our marriage. And it's definitely put me into perspective of what my purpose is and who I am. Oh, I love that. I love that. He is definitely a little spitfire, though. He's dramatic like his mother. I do have to say that. And <laughs> now that he's three, just seeing his character come out, it's just wonderful to see. And he's yeah. talking. Being a heart patient and having a toddler is challenging sometimes because you definitely do not have the energy that they do. So you have to keep up with them and try your best to stay as healthy as you can. So that way you can keep up with their energy levels. <laughs> Absolutely. And the same is true when you're an older mom. I was 31 when I had Alex. And I remember thinking, I don't know how these women who wait until they're in their 40s do it. Because at that time, I was 31 and I had a three-year-old and a baby. It was a lot to take care of. And I just remember thinking, okay, this is it. We always only wanted two kids. And that was all I was going to have the energy to do because I had two little boys that were full of energy. So talk to me about what words of advice you would have for somebody else who's in your position. They're newly married and they've decided, yes, we want to have a family, even though I only have half a heart. I would say definitely talk to your doctors, definitely talk to your team and come up with a game plan that you both are comfortable with. The thing that I needed to learn is that doctors have a plan and so do you. And how can we meet in the middle to make it safe and also stick to your wishes? Like I could have easily just went to Texas Children's Hospital, but I knew that was going to put a lot of stress on my family. So being able to voice your opinion and be an advocate for yourself with your team and your doctor was a huge key to my pregnancy. I'm so proud of you that you did that, Katie, because all of that driving back and forth and having mm -hmm. to go to Houston, for those of my listeners who are listening outside of Texas, driving in Houston is probably one of the most stressful things a Texan can go through when they don't live in Houston, even when they do live in Houston. Like my sister lives right outside of Houston and she does everything she can 
not to have to drive in Houston traffic. It's very stressful. I think that you being an advocate for yourself and saying, no, I think we can do it. It shows what confidence you had in your care team here at Baylor Scott and White that you truly believed that you could get the care that you needed at your local hospital. So I think that speaks very highly of Baylor Scott and White and of the relationship that you had developed with your cardiologist. If you hadn't had such a good relationship with your cardiologist, I doubt that you would have felt that it was a good idea for you to just stay local. Correct. And it was funny because I had only had that cardiologist for a year. I had seen the same doctor since I was six years old. But just becoming an adult and being closer to Temple, I wanted a closer team to me. Right. Because I remember you asking me who Alex saw and I told you it was Dr. Pliska. So you actually did have Dr. Pliska before he left. Yes. Yes. Oh my gosh, what a blessing. When I was going to the hospital so much before my pacemaker, my electrophysiologist was like, I want you to see Pliska. He's really good. He's great with adult congenital heart patients. So I would love for you to see him. And that's when our connection grew. So that's whenever my team was stressing because they just now figured me out and figured out how my heart works. And I'm coming to them like, I'm pregnant. So what are we going to do? Oh, my gosh. Okay. I think your words of advice are well spoken. You need to be the best advocate you can be for yourself, your family, and your baby. Mm -hmm. Yes. But it's nice to know that if you would have started meeting with Dr. Pliskin, your electrophysiologist would have said, this is turning out to be more complicated than we'd like. At least you had Texas Children's within driving distance right. and Correct. you could go there. So it's nice that you had that plan B. I think it's good to have a plan B, yes. especially when you're as complicated a case as you are. Yes. So will Isaiah have a brother or sister someday, do you think? Yes. We definitely want that. We will not skip the step this time and we will talk to the doctors <laughs> first and go with a plan there. But my birthday's Tuesday. I'll be 28. We're still young. So we're still just trying to, like you said, we didn't have time to figure things out. So before we add another sibling, we just have some things in order we want to kind of work through. But yes, we definitely want to have more kids. I want Isaiah to have siblings to grow up with. Oh, I just love that. We have to get together and have lunch sometime, Katie, so I can see this beautiful Isaiah in person instead of just on Facebook. But it has been delightful catching up with you after all these years. So thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you for (laughs) having me, Anna. Oh, I'm so glad we did this. And we're going to have to do it again sometime soon and talk more about what it's like to be the mommy of a toddler. Because I have a feeling you have some toddler stories that would be so much fun for us to hear about. But our time is up, my friends. I'm so sad. Our time is up. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Hey, please check out the raffle we're having for our beautiful handmade quilt. Dr. Sandra Creech is the lovely lady who made a quilt and donated it to us for our fundraiser. Visit heartsunitetheglobe.org and you can see photos of the quilt. And that's where you can buy your raffle ticket to win a chance on the quilt. It's $10 for a ticket or 12 tickets for $100. If you don't want to buy a ticket for the raffle because you don't need a quilt, you can always just make a donation. There's a button for that too. So thank you so much, my friends. That does conclude this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Thanks for listening today. Don't forget, tomorrow is Heart Dad Sunday, and my husband, Frank Jaworski, will be the guest host, and he will be interviewing a heart dad. So tune in tomorrow, and in the meantime, remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have become inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart community. Heart to Heart with Anna with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard at any time wherever you get your podcasts. A new episode is released every Tuesday from noon Eastern time.